Good evening, listeners of the Latin Prayer Podcast. I am so excited to share with you an interview that I've done with Father Robert Fromjot of FSSP. I've been wanting to interview Father for a while, particularly because of his background in music and chant in particular, but also because he has a tremendous love for the Latin language. In this interview, we cover his vocation story, his formation through FSSP, why particularly the extraordinary mass Latin, and we talk about projects that we're going to be doing together that I think will be very useful to the listeners of the Latin Prayer Podcast. Many of you have been requesting teaching Latin videos, and that is something that Father Fromageau and I are going to be working on together. So I apologize for the audio quality. We did not have this planned thoroughly in advance. It was very impromptu, really just throwing up a microphone in between the two of us and having a conversation. And so there are interruptions, there are noises in the background, but stay with it. The content is what you're after. I tried to edit it several times um, to try to edit out phone calls coming in and things like that, but eventually I just gave up and figured I would not delay in throwing up the episode. So here it is. I hope you enjoy. This is Father Robert Fromageau and myself having a conversation about all things Latin and Catholic. God love you. Valete. Well, good morning, Father. Good morning, Dylan. Thank you so much for saying yes to being interviewed for uh, the Latin Prayer Podcast. Uh, I wanted to start off just by asking you a little bit about yourself. Maybe you can give some of the listeners a short history lesson of uh, where your vocation came from, and then in particular, how did you end up Uh, part of the FSSP, why the traditional Latin rite? All right, so unlike perhaps many of our priests, I grew up in the uh, Novus Ordo Church. I was going to church long before the FSSP even existed. When I went to college, however, that Thomas Aquinas College, that was the first place I was introduced to Latin in the liturgy because even though it was the Novus Ordo, the ordinary form as uh, it's called now, uh, the everything was in Latin except for the readings, I believe. So that was my uh, introduction to a more conservative expression of the new mass communion rails, uh, veils, a lot of women wore veils, Mm -hmm. there was Gregorian chant, polyphony. Wow. So uh, it was a very unusual, uh, rare expression of the ordinary form compared to what I had experienced, not just in my hometown growing up, but also in the military where I saw any number of things, conservative chaplains versus very liberal chaplains. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I discerned that there was actually a a difference in quality, liturgically speaking, in the world of the Novus Ordo. Right. I had experienced that myself. Now, my, uh, the summer before my freshman year, I was working at the college and there was a, a fellow student who was entering his sophomore year who looked very monastic in his bearing. He had he was bald, he had a beard, scraggly beard. Oh, wow. Very somewhat introverted, very quiet. So it seemed to me that he was interested in a vocation. I thought maybe a Benedictine monastery. Right. So I asked him one day, well, are you thinking of a vocation where and so forth? And he said, yes, I'm thinking of uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter. I said, what's that? I never heard of it. This was 1990. Mm-hmm. So the fraternity was only two years old at the time. Right. So that was my first exposure just to the mention of the Fraternity of St. Peter. During my four years there, I was also introduced to the Old Mass. 
Mm -hmm. And it's not as though the first time I went, I was bold, blown away and said, oh, this is, what am I doing with another sword? Mm -hmm. It wasn't that. Uh, it, because I wasn't going frequently enough for that to happen, I think. Right. I think I went to a Requiem Mass. That was my first Mass, wow. actually, that I went to. It was in the fall. It was for the, for the anniversary, I think, of a, of a priest uh, who actually ministered up here in Vancouver. And uh, a lot of the students down there knew him, and so they, they had this Requiem Mass. Now, I, I was a little bit distracted because I didn't know I didn't know that it was going to be a requiem mass. I was a bit blindsided. I was like, "What is going on here? Is this is this is this illicit and so forth?" Right. Yeah. So I was not in the proper mindset to appreciate what was going on. In any case, my junior year, mm-hmm. it was very interesting. Uh, for the the Holy Thursday Mass, the Maundy Thursday Mass, as it's called, I was asked to sing with another two or three people at a Maundy Thursday Mass that was going to be done in the extraordinary form. Mm -hmm. At the same time, well, and I said yes, but at the same time, I was was a part of the school and the choir of of the the Nova Sordo community, let's call it that. So, and and it hadn't occurred to me at the time that technically speaking, you're supposed to have only one Mass in any given community. So there sh- officially, there should have been only the one Mass mm-hmm. on campus. But the, it turns out because of the decision or the determination of one of the chaplains, he wanted to have the old Mass, maybe to provide for the needs of those students who had a certain attachment to it. Right. Uh, to uh, paraphrase Benedict XVI. Mm-hmm. So I said, yeah, so that's fine. It didn't, didn't occur to me, this is a problem, right? Yeah, right, no problem. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so we, we sang at the, the Nova Soto version of the Monday Thursday Mass, and this was no cheap Mass, or it wasn't, liturgically it was pretty good. In retrospect, it could have been even better, but mm-hmm. musically speaking, we had, uh, I think it was the Misa Papa Marichalis of okay, Palestrina. Yeah. Wow. Famous Mass, uh, we had Gregorian chant, mm-hmm. uh, so everything was was pretty pretty good I yeah. mean, compared to most other places right. celebrating yeah. Mass that evening. So right after the Blessed Sacrament was was processed as it is after right. Monday Thursday Mass and put in the on the altar of repose, then uh, a friend of mine and I uh, dashed down to the other smaller chapel. Mm-hmm. another part of the campus where everybody was waiting for us to get there and so we started we did the exact pretty much the same mass only it was the the old form mm-hmm. uh, the chant was the same as I recall we didn't have polyphony okay um, and the but the effect the the impact of that liturgy uh, was very different from the impact of the, the new mm-hmm. yeah and the new, the again, what I had just uh, participated in was was pretty high level, That's right. liturgically speaking. And even though it was just a, a misa cantata, not the it wasn't all this all the stops are being pulled right. here. Right. It's the misa cantata, fairly relatively simple musically, mm-hmm. just Gregorian chant. Uh, both of us, we we left there thinking. What just happened? That was so right. incredible, and the sense of the transcendent was was overpowering. So uh, that's that got me to to thinking. At the time, I was I was contemplating a, a priestly vocation anyway, uh, but I realized it's not simply a matter of going to finding a conservative diocese or going to a seminary that will be orthodox. I now had to consider the liturgy. <laughs> because I knew that if a liturgy existed out there that was permitted, that was qualitatively uh, more dense and, and had a certain depth to it, uh, that put the focus on the Eucharist so much more powerfully right. than, than what I was normally used to, uh, I would not be able to... Uh, exercise or operate properly as a priest 
in the Novus Ordo, knowing that that liturgy existed. Right? Oh, really? I, was, I was undermining myself. I'd go crazy, especially given the, the the artistic depth of the old mass, which I was I had gradually uh, became uh, aware of. Uh, it just so happened that the the same chaplain, I think his father had died. Okay. And he wanted to, this was the following semester, and he wanted to have a set of Gregorian masses said for him. And so, and he wanted to do that in the old mass. So he, this is a 30 day period Space. of celebrating uh, mass with the intention of the, the deceased in question. So, mm-hmm. so the same friend of mine and I, we would, we would, if we were available, we would uh, just show up and sing the mass, right? Because we could we could read chant pretty easily, and we're both musicians, so that wasn't a problem. Okay. And the priest was all too happy to have some music and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. So uh, that led to so that was a, a much deeper exposure, a more prolonged exposure to mm-hmm. the old mass with me singing it. And then what I realized was because I was still singing in the school and the choir for the... That was my next course question, yes. was were you still attending yeah, and oh yeah, participating? Sure. Yes. Okay. So I got to compare even further. Right. In this case, it was the, the, the way in which the parts of the Mass and the partakers of the Mass interact. Uh, by that I mean, how, how does the, the, say, the introid interact with what the priest is doing in the sanctuary? Is there a lot of waiting around in the sanctuary while we're doing our thing and vice versa? Mm-hmm. What's how is it coordinated? What's the integration uh, quotient, if you will? Right. And and I I could see that the 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 old mass integrated these various parts better, uh, with the exception of something like the gradual and the alleluia, where where the the priest is is. Uh, stationary and this, it makes sense because the gradual is actually a time for people to meditate to do to engage in a little bit of mental prayer about what they just heard mm-hmm. maybe what they're about to hear mm-hmm. it gives them that time and space mm-hmm. so even the priest is is seated uh, so he's not just waiting he's he's if he's savvy if he's exploiting a liturgy for how it's supposed to be used He's he's meditating on the mysteries of the faith or some some detail mentioned yeah. in scripture or whatever, right. or maybe about what he's going to preach. I Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he might, yeah. He may not have prepared. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that that that's makes sense. But for example, during the offertory, um, the there may be. You can the, the the choir can sing the offertory and maybe a motet stuff like this, and the priest can carry on with what he's doing. He doesn't have to stop uh, in order to say the people orate frate, you know, right. uh, pray brethren. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't have to do that. He can he goes right up to the beginning of the preface. Right? That's right. Yeah. And uh, so there's no there, that's what I mean by a certain integration. And while the Santus is being sung, he recites the Sanctus himself because mm-hmm. he's he's acting in persona Christi as mm-hmm. the, the configured to the head of the of the body of Christ, namely Christ. And so since worship is going through the head, mm-hmm. he's not just going to ignore that. He too will will say it to himself, even if it's being sung at the same time. And he's not going to sing with the choir because he that enables him to carry on with the canon. Yes. And so by the time the Sanctus is finished, if say it's a, a chanted Sanctus, then he's usually around the Hank Iji tour That's right. uh, by the time the Sanctus is finished. Uh, so this causes things to move along nice and smoothly, whereas if the priest has to wait uh, in order for the Sanctus to finish, then it's like you're at a, a ping pong or a tennis yep. match. Yep. The ball is in the court of the, sen- of the, the choir and then yep. it gets tossed over to the sanctuary. This, I this love that analogy because so, at, so this is all happening while like you're, you're noticing these differences yes. or these, these uh, uh, movements uh, from one style versus another. Right. Right. And you're, because I, I did music at a Nova Sordo parish for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways as I was, uh, exiting one of the hardest things for me to do was to give up that ministry 
uh, because I built it from scratch. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I started doing was teaching other people. And the what you just said about the ping pong match, I would say the baton. It's passing mm-hmm. the baton yeah, from, so from one to the other. And I, I, I'm... I'm, I, and maybe have never been able to put it into words until just now, mm-hmm. because I was trying to uh, wrestled with for a long time the differences and the similarities and why one way versus another, mm-hmm. and particularly in the the song masses and the in the old right that the, it's it flows. It's not a passing yes. of the baton. That's right. It, there's there's some overlap there of right. like one moves into the other to movement. Right. Essentially, in the in the old mass. In my experience, when I'm singing, I feel like I'm a part of the liturgy. <laughs> I'm, I'm a part of a greater whole, mm-hmm. subordinate to what's going on at the sanctuary, of course, right. but um, we're, we're subordinate to that. In the new, uh, singing for the new, which I had done for many years, uh, it's almost as though you, you feel as, as though, <clears throat> or at least you, you can be certainly easily tempted to think that you have a spotlight on you, mm-hmm. which is a very different oh, totally. psychological no. feeling yeah. and can lead to all kinds of, of uh, yeah. temptations to pride and fame glory. There, and, so and even just the, the way that the church is designed in, yeah, the, in, in the, the new mass. If, right, if you're up in the front, all the more Oh yeah, the way, exactly, you know? totally. So yeah. that's, we'll that's come, that's we'll come back to the chant stuff <laughs> uh, later, but I, I didn't want to, to, to uh, tangent you off sure, your, sure. your vocation story. That's right. So, so as as a result of my encounter with the the old mass uh, at uh, Thomas Aquinas College, I decided then to to look into the priestly fraternity of St. Peter myself. Mm-hmm. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Priestly fraternity of St. Peter. That's right. Yes. And uh, and so that was after about. 18 months of uh, working to pay off uh, what debt remained, mm-hmm. uh, I joined the fraternity and uh, never looked back. Wonderful. So the... the what year was this now? That, that you was 1996. 96, okay. Fall of 96. And then your formation process, how many years, what was that like? How many years okay, was that? Okay, so normally, uh, I believe it's seven years. Okay. But because I had had uh, uh, a formation already in philosophy and to some extent theology mm-hmm. at TAC, uh, we were able to uh, to jump past the thought we didn't have to take philosophy again. Right. So that was, I don't know if they still do that, they probably don't, but uh, so I, I you you were able to accelerate to, your yes all the TAC grads who went to the fraternity basically had five years of formation rather than seven okay wonderful and then when you graduated out of the um, and then so it uh, I know that and this is all new to me because I'm still learning this mm-hmm. because you were there are uh, minor ordinations am I saying that correctly yes or what's where it called. Uh, the, the old terminology, I should say, the traditional mm-hmm. terminology, the minor orders. Minor orders, okay. Right. So you're, first there's like, and I, I'm going to get it wrong, but I know there's there's uh, a lector, uh, exorcist, right. acolyte, like there's a whole bunch of different... Right, porter, lector, exorcist, acolyte. Okay. But the, the, the first, the first uh, big change it's not an ordination, mm. but it was traditionally when a person entered into the clerical state mm-hmm. uh, until uh, the various reforms of Paul VI. That was with tonsure. So traditionally, when a person was tonsured, the tonsure used to be the sign, the outward sign that someone was in the clerical state. Mm. And then that person would would maintain the tonsure, uh, unless he was bald or something. Then of course, yeah, then he didn't sorry, have, there was already a tonsure. Yes. No sharpie on the so, side. That's right. yeah. So that you, that was the, the the sign of the of the clerical state. Not and today, it's more the the, the collar. collar, right? right. Uh, so uh, today, though, the so a person can still be tonsured, but canonically speaking, he's not 
he's not a cleric. You, gotcha. you enter the clerical state only with the diaconate. Correct, yes. Uh, so That's why they called him Reverend Mr. at the that's diaconate. Right, that's yes. Right. Yeah. So the 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 tonsure and then the the various minor orders are they essentially are seen as steps right. that lead to the priesthood. Correct. And psychologically actually that's very important mm -hmm. where you you are getting closer to uh, that for which you are in the seminary in the first place yes and the with the various minor orders there are certain liturgical roles that you can perform right so an acolyte is the one that would serve mass right. at the loma is it yes the uh, and he he would be the one can carrying the, the the candle. That's yes. that's that's why he's called an acolyte. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the it's the Greek word, but it, it has to do with with carrying these these candles. Uh, the porter is someone who officially and traditionally would was opening up the door mm -hmm. uh, and maintaining order in the church. Right? Would, Which is not, some sort of a sure. <laughs> right, but he doesn't have much of a job if if everything is relatively orderly at least in the seminary. Uh, and then with the subdiaconate, mm -hmm. that's where you you then are the subdeacon uh, at mass, and you're a little bit closer. You 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 have this privilege of removing the pall mm -hmm. at the priest's communion. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. The pall and and uh, uh, there might be something. Oh, you can wear the maniple. I was going to ask about the maniple. So yeah, you, okay. and your yeah. vestments are are. On a, on a par with the the chasuble, yeah, dogmatic. But you have the the subdeacon has a tunicle, and then with the diaconate, you're that much closer. That's right. right. You're, you're like that nice sash and all that. You got the stole. That's right. And stole, and you yeah. have the authority to preach. Right. You you can um, now liturgically you're when the priest offers the chalice. Right. He the the deacon uh, holds it with him. Wow. See? So another. Level, right. yes. you're, you're closer to the the. Uh, and what that does the for the mind see, of, of right. the formation of it's, a, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's very psychologically wise to have these steps, so that you're not the 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 change that is that comes about with the diaconate is not so dramatic. Right. right. If you, I mean, now people go to the seminary, they might receive. Uh, what they call now, what do they call them, uh, ministries, instituted ministries or something, I forget. And they, they changed the word, I think, because they were, uh, they were, they had a problem with the equivocation of order. Right. Minor orders, were, well, no, the only order is the priesthood. Right. Uh, the diaconate. Yeah. So those are, so those, what are called major orders. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's, this is true. The, the, we're not talking about sacraments with respect to the other right. things. Right. Uh, Still, they have a psychological purpose, and they are ordered to mm -hmm. the Eucharist. There is, a, there's a, there's a, there is a basis in reality for calling them minor orders. Makes so you much are, sense. You are in an, a certain place, right? Yes. And you're ordered to a certain right. uh, place, so and a function. So uh, the, I mean, I just can't imagine how it feels to go from basically being. A layman in some seminaries, the seminaries don't even wear clerical garb at mm -hmm. all yeah. until they reach the diaconate. Yeah. And so, with the diaconate, they, they take uh, you know, vows of, of chastity. They take or not vows, but promises. Right. Uh, they enter into the celibate state in a, in a very formal way, uh, and other clerics, and then they have to preach and, and so forth. So they have they psychologically, it seems that. They haven't really been. They haven't been able to take advantage yeah. of of these steps. It's like you have to do a. a there's this one giant step. You got to. You got to. Yeah. Leap up to the this high thing here. There's yeah. Steps to get up to. Yeah. Uh, and there's a beautiful image um, of steps with the yes, minor orders. I, I've right. seen this yes. in the, the, the old uh, right. manuals or manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you, so you went through that process. You were, uh, and then, uh, w would you say that? Um, did you did you know, or did you, looking back, I'm sure, into your development or growing up as in, in the Novus Ordo, was 
as you were going through seminary now and and uh, and and formation, did you look back at that or look at the world around you um, at you know maybe what you were missing or what that 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 you have? Were you aware that there, that this is not how it's done everywhere else? That 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 this is something unique and something special and at that stage. Well. In the, when I was in the seminary, mm-hmm. as you were going through this formation, yes, no, I knew, I knew very well that that what we had, like the minor order stuff like this, Rest, this was yes. not typical. Okay, was, yeah, I knew that. Okay, uh, and so now I've noticed that uh, your command, so sort of switching gears here and, and, and turning that off. And by the way, that's phenomenal, beautiful formation story. Uh, where did your, I guess love or attachment to or attraction to uh, Latin and understanding it or getting a, a, a firm grasp of it. Where did that begin in this process? Well, I would say uh, prior to that, uh, I have a, a, a general love of language or at least an interest mm-hmm. in different languages. Uh, my first language was actually French, not English, oh, though yeah. my command of French is not uh, as strong as say a native French speaker because right. English took over pretty quickly and French wasn't, unfortunately, wasn't reinforced, reinforced as much as I would, uh, as I now would, would have uh, wanted it to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but that was sufficient for me to realize that that something can be expressed in different languages and even depending on what language you use, the, the, the same thought can have a different connotation or um, just the, or the same object can be expressed in different ways. Mm-hmm. Like for example, I remember I took German in high school and uh, the, we, in English, we, we talk about a vacuum cleaner, right? a very abstract way of describing something. Mm -hmm. There's a vacuum that's created, it's very scientific, Mm -hmm. and then it cleans. Mm -hmm. Um, The Germans are much more literal in their Mm -hmm. description of things. And uh, I forget what the the German word is now, but but they would say the English, the literal English translation of the German word for vacuum cleaner is dust sucker. (laughs) That's awesome. Makes sense. Right. Yeah, it's very sensible. And so I was first introduced to Latin in, it was like a 10 week, uh, get your feet wet type of approach uh, in, I think it was seventh grade. Okay. We went through a bunch of languages. This was to give people, a, a, give the students an opportunity to have a, like a taste test. Right. And then they could choose what language they wanted to take. Gotcha. The following year, I think. So, so I was introduced to classical Latin at that point but nothing really came of it. Uh, the next time was in college. There we studied Latin more, I think, just to, to appreciate grammar in general. Okay. Since this is, grammar is, is part of the uh, trivium, mm-hmm. like grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Mm-hmm. So it's a formal study of how one speaks, and Latin is very helpful for that because there's a certain visual component uh, you 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 see the word change many a, a lot a lot more than in English, mm-hmm. depending on how it's used in the sentence, right? Depending on its function. So uh, so Latin was was studied in in I studied Latin rather in college and then of course uh, again in seminary, and so it was just another language uh, that I. Uh, was studying. I should mention in the army. I also studied very intensely Arabic. Wow. So, okay. uh, uh, so languages are not uh, foreign to me. To, mm-hmm. No pun intended. Mm-hmm. Uh, the or the idea of studying for a language and, and seeing how it expresses reality, how it how it that's very cool. How it conveys this or that. So I was I was uh, certainly into Latin quite a bit for that. But also, I think the other connection that I shouldn't uh, fail to mention is that I was uh, singing a lot of Latin mm. from college onwards. I, I joined the, the choir and mm-hmm. the and the scola, yeah. and so a lot of motets are in Latin. Yeah. 
and mm-hmm. all of the Gregorian chant is in right. Latin. So right. that was just another layer or another way of learning Latin. And what I think what was very helpful there was that I became, I think I was more sensitive to the pronunciation of Latin mm-hmm. because in, in, with music you, you, you really have to you want to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of pronunciation or, you, or you're going to ask, is this, am I doing this the right way? You know? right. So in that of course uh, ties in with or carries over into the celebration of the Mass whether they're singing or not uh, I'm going to uh, be I'm probably more careful about pronunciation than, than a lot of priests. Understood. Because yeah. of the, the musical the background. The background that, yeah. Right. So uh, now uh, this particular podcast has a lot of people that are discovering Latin for the first time. Yes. A lot of them very much like yourself, you know, they've probably grown up in a Novus Ordo mm-hmm. environment parish and are either getting their feet wet and tasting tradition for the very first yes. time and i've i've noticed this even just with my own journey my wife's journey my kids and kids are still very young mm-hmm. but even then with like my mother-in-law or father-in-law or my mom and dad when they come the very first i guess roadblock they feel that they have to overcome is i'm not going to understand anything right uh, i'm going to get there and it's all in latin so I'm, it's not going to make any sense to me right so th- this podcast was sort of kind of a way to help people n- not have too many butterflies in their stomach right. to make it easier more yes. palatable yes. and now it's expanding so in your own words what would you why do you think it's important whether it's people that have been going to the traditional latin mass for a while or people that are just coming to it why should they understand or attempt to learn latin well I would say, first of all, in terms of understanding, uh, there are different levels of understanding, not of, not of Latin, but of, of the Mass. Um, and I think it's a sign of, of our rationalistic culture that we, we put a huge emphasis on the comprehension of texts. <laughs> as if that were, if we don't do that, then we don't understand anything. Hmm. Uh, whereas the, the truth is that, yes, the, 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 the words used, that's a certain one layer of understanding, but there's a deeper understanding, a deeper level, where, for example, you understand that there's something sacred going on. Mm-hmm. A child will get that even if he doesn't understand a word of Latin totally. or, or of English. <laughs> right, yes. He'll understand there's something different here if the liturgy is being done in a way that's in accordance with its own nature. Yes. It's, it's a sacred uh, event. The, the, a person, if he's properly catechized, will also grasp very clearly from a well-celebrated Mass that the Eucharist is front and center, that there's, it's a sacrifice, it's not just a community meal. Uh, he will understand too, if again, if the liturgy is being done properly, uh, that there is, uh, it's an opportunity, uh, one that makes, I should say, that makes it an easier thing to do, but it's an opportunity to pray, right? to pray, to worship, to, to, center oneself, if you will, uh, to, to essentially uh, be set apart from the, the uh, hustle and bustle of the world. Right. So all of these things can be understood even if you don't understand Latin. Right? Beautiful. That, that would be the first thing I'd say. Uh, the second is that, at least for English speakers, and to say in French and Spanish and so forth, uh, but not for Korean or Japanese. Uh, if you go to a Latin Mass, at least fairly regularly, frequently, you will notice that you under, actually understand a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in fact, there's so much Latin in English that we, you could say that we are speaking <laughs> a modern form of Latin. Yes. With English. Is that, what is it, 60, 70% of English yeah, words totally. derive from Latin? Yeah. Uh, if we spoke English using only Anglo 
words and mm-hmm. words that truly are from English and not Latin. First of all, we'd be trouble communicating. We'd have some trouble, right? <laughs> That's right. So you communicating there, you just use a Latin-based word. Yeah. Uh, so when a person hears the Latin of the Mass he will begin to see connections between the words used and his own English vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, it's it, it, the, what's missing is this, the, the perhaps obviously there are other Latin words, there's, there's stuff that is not used in English, mm-hmm. uh, but also the, the way in which Latin works, the, the, the endings of verbs, for example. What What is it that conveys first person, second person, third person, singular and plural and so forth? Uh, how does that happen? Or or how are nouns declined, right? We don't decline nouns mm-hmm. in, in English, so That's right. how, what, what are the mechanics of a language, right? That's something that, that it would be very difficult to pick up just going to mass. Right. So that's the sort of thing that people uh, could learn the better to understand what's going on. Uh, now, something else to say about Latin. Latin is used because it it adds to the sense of the sacred. Right? It's known as a sacred language. Not that it's never used in any other medium. I mean, if you want to do canon law, you better yeah. do Latin too. Yeah. Even though I don't call canon law a uh, Sacred. A sacred, a sacred uh, area. Right, and right. It's very helpful, but it's not sacred. Mm-hmm. Although some canon lawyers might disagree with me. Mm-hmm. In any case, uh, Latin is is a, just another way in which the mass can be experienced as a a an event that is set apart. That's what to, to be sacred means. It's something that's been set apart for some specific purpose. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you enter a church, usually you have steps to climb. So the, the, the very level of the church is set apart from the, the level of the profane. Right. Uh, you enter the church, maybe the doors are not just regular old, I don't know, glass doors of some right. sort that you would see in a, in a typical building. No, they're maybe they're somewhat ornate, there's something special about them, mm-hmm. but everything that's around you is is helping to convey the sense of the sacred, uh, the type of music used, uh, and the language that is used. Mm-hmm. So and the other thing to consider is that is that when you hear Mass in Latin, you eventually become aware of the fact that what you are experiencing is what your forebears experienced hundreds of years ago, mm-hmm. uh, almost a thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. You could say. They experienced it in, in granted with some differences perhaps, uh, but, but the, the Latin text was what they were hearing. You could say on the, you know, in 1450, uh, when it was the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, mm-hmm. This is what they heard. Right? Wow! This is what was there, and so there's a. It ties you with, with history. It it ties you with your the previous generation, so you don't feel completely isolated. Isolated. You're you're, you're tied to uh, the, the the communion. The, the community of believers, not just in your own present time. Let's say the, we're worshiping here in Vancouver. Others are worshiping in New York, wherever. Mm-hmm. It's it's also through time, right? So yeah. that's that's a very very helpful thing, especially if you happen to be out in the boondock somewhere. Yeah, You've got this Latin mass is connecting you with with not just people around the world, but people through, through time. history. Yes, yeah, through history. Yeah. That's that's psychologically very very helpful. One of the things that I heard about a Latin, I heard I've known this for a while, but someone reminded me of this that. Latin was one of the three languages that was that that was, that was on the cross right. with Christ, mm-hmm. and that's set that's apart. Right. That's right. And in order for it to be preserved uh, from profanity, you know, a lot of languages. I believe mm-hmm. actually it was uh, Taylor Marshall had yes. done a podcast with uh, Jesse Romero where they were mm-hmm. talking about this. But the profanity that's used in a lot of languages today, that uh, you know, to do harm or to do evil, or and not that you know people aren't trying to do that with Latin, but even just in the colloquial carelessness uh, you know to, to be able to take the name of our Lord in vain or things like that in Latin you don't find that in its in its ability because it's now a dead language uh, for the most part I mean people do speak Latin and I, I'm a 
firm believer in in teaching language, teaching Latin rather, as you would any other language. Mm. So we know how it uh, can be pronounced, or actually, I mean, there are different ways of pronouncing the language, but there's classical Latin, and ecclesiastical Latin, Latin pronunciation. Uh, but we we have a good idea. <laughs> we right. know pretty well how to do that. Right. And to neglect the speaking part of of a language, it's true. It makes it into a dead language. It, it, it heads in that direction, mm-hmm. um, which has its advantages, I suppose. But still, speaking Latin is not something that should be avoided. Oh, otherwise we'll we'll make it into a living language. Right. And it's true that. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go so far as Taylor Marshall. I, I mean, yes, it's it's such, since it's spoken so little. Mm-hmm. I suppose there's there's less chance. Who who knows how to how to use profanity in Latin? Oh right, yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> but let's not forget that that until what maybe the '60s, uh, the the business was conducted in the Hungarian Parliament in Latin. Mm-hmm. Everybody spoke Latin. They were very good at it because that was one way of unifying the the, the, the same empire. Page, and so right? forth. There were all these disparate cultures and so forth. So speaking Latin was a way of of keeping the peace, so to speak, right. not exercising yeah. some kind of cultural hegemony in the parliament. So, uh, but it has been set apart, in it, particularly yes. in ecclesiastical right. Latin. We know that it's it's not just a use, but there's an efficacy about it because the words mean exact. There's no mixing right. or mincing. Well, there's, and the fact that it, there's a stability there because, for example, the the Nicene Creed mm-hmm. has been that way since 381. Right? Yes, and or well, and it was introduced into the liturgy. I think in the 12th century, uh, courtesy of the uh, I think Emperor Henry II, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. went to Rome and was like, "What? You don't have the the creed? What's going on?" <laughs> right. Like, well, we don't need it. We're not. We don't have any heresies to, to worry about. <laughs> right. But eventually, Rome accepted yeah. it, and, and it became part of the liturgy. Uh, so, but the creed is a is a a, a very stable text. Uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. I hope. Mm-hmm. And it, it so the, the vocabulary is is stable, right? Uh, and you can say that generally about say the canon of the mass and so forth. So it's it's not as if they're technical terms, right? But there's a there's a again a stability that is is provided there. You're using a a, a language that that fosters the the let's say the gravitas the the. The permanence, the sense of permanence of the liturgy, which is yeah. which then gives you the sense of eternity. Mm-hmm. That's very helpful. Whereas if you're using a profane language, which is different from profanity, but mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. profane is not bad; it's just not set apart. Right. So, so uh, using a a language that is uh, typically used, say in business, that's the English language. It's the the lingua franca. Now, yeah. if I can make a pun there. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, the, it's, it, it's used in all kinds of different ways, and it's just not a sacred language. It yeah. hasn't, if, if you wanted to make English into a sacred language, it seems you'd have to do what was done with Latin. You'd have to be very careful about what kind of vocabulary you're using, the way in which you're speaking, are we going to say thou and thee? Well, that might help. Okay, perhaps, mm-hmm. perhaps not. But that's these would be the kinds of questions that you ask. Right. You're not just going to say, well, let's just bring in the English the way we normally speak. Right? Yes. Unless you're not interested in the sacred, the, the, the cultivating a sense of the sacred, then yeah, do whatever you want. No. Uh, so uh, that's that's very important. Uh, that said, one of the ways in which Latin produces or or uh, enhances the sense of the sacred is the fact that it's not well understood <laughs> okay right now i think that i mean it sounded like a veil and i was like oh yeah mysterious however i think that the the sense of the sacred is not going to be uh, unduly compromised if people go there and understand exactly what is being said because they have studied latin mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that at all they're simply using Latin in a and understanding it uh, in a in a sacred context, yes. uh, which is, is is still holds even if they understand every word perfectly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all for understanding Latin, uh, mm-hmm. but 
I don't think it should be the 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 only thing focused on is if that's the only thing to understand and if I don't understand the language then then no oh, I have a terrible problem here yeah uh, and one the other thing that should be should be appreciated with Latin is that it transcends many many cultures and so if you happen to have and this is very common if you happen to have a parish where you have a lot of English speaking people and a lot of Spanish speaking people, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to wind up with two, essentially two parishes, two worship communities, faith communities, as people yeah. say today, yeah. based on the different languages. Yeah, we've seen uh, that happen very, so many uh, times. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a big pastoral challenge. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's a big pastoral challenge to, um, to unite or keep united a, a parish that is divided. Uh, according to language. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll end up. Yeah. So that is, uh, this is something that Latin overcomes. Yeah, this fracturing uh, yeah. within That's Catholic right. communities. So yeah. some some people think the solution is, well, we're going to have, we'll have a mass and we'll have some parts in English and some parts in Spanish, which means that everybody will understand only part of the mass if they right. say they don't, they're not bilingual. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's really a a I think that's not the, the solution. The solution is to use a language, let's say that nobody understands. Yeah, <laughs> then, that's then it's equal. It's a, everyone's equal. the same. Nobody right. feels that, that there's any right. kind of cultural imposition being done. You know, the cultural imperialism that people like to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, and so the the everyone feels again the the liturgy has been set apart. It's not part of English culture. It's not part of Spanish culture. It's yeah. It's on its own. It's set yeah, apart. This and is Latin the, does that. Yeah, it's the eternal. And, and I, I've appreciated having these conversations with people and encouraging them to attend a Latin mm -hmm. Mass. Mm -hmm. Like with my father-in-law, this, this one time we were speaking, I said, you know, look, it, what's happening here really is we're, we're at the foot of the cross. That's what's taking place. What, what do you do at the foot of the cross? Mm -hmm. Like, if you just stop and think about this for a second, if, if you're actually there, there's this puncture hole through time, and now we're here. What's our job? Our, our, our job is not necessarily it's to, to do anything specific right. other than to be present and to pray and to... Well, yes, although I would not want to take this analogy too far. Right. Because, uh, as I have heard some argue, the Virgin Mary was our Lord's best disciple. Yes. His mother. And... As far as the gospel record is concerned, uh, she didn't say anything at the cross, or at least she didn't say anything that, say, St. John thought was necessary to write right in right. for our salvation so that we might believe. Right. No. So, for all intents and purposes, she's silent at the cross. Mm -hmm. And then some have argued, well, if that's the model, then we should all be silent at mass right. in fact then the low mass is the best mass that's oh, the right, I mass. See. Yeah. and then you go down this Another rabbit, rabbit hole that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's completely right. bogus because the normative mass is actually the solemn mass right. where people have a, a role to do they, yeah. they're supposed to sing unless it's polyphony they're, they're supposed to sing the ordinary the mass and the response of the right. yes like that's this. right yes. that's that's their job, so to speak. That's yeah. how they, one way in which they participate. Now, it's, it's again, it's a layer of participation. The other, obviously, is interior, where, the, where prayer is supposed to be taking place. Right. Uh, something else to keep in mind is that uh, the there are different purposes of the Mass. One is to offer the sacrifice of the Mass in uh, reparation or atonement for sin. Yes. Uh, another is Thanksgiving, right? mm -hmm. worship, mm -hmm. uh, propitiation, yeah. or uh, petition rather, infiltration. Yeah. So you, you, I wouldn't say that when you were at the foot of the cross, or if you were at the foot of the cross, like the Virgin Mary wasn't giving thanks to God. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, perhaps maybe she's okay. I'm giving thanks to God because this is His plan, and and yeah. my son is doing this for the salvation of mankind, etc. You know, so. Okay, but but on the, the most human level, she would be fulfilling with, all uh, of those. With, yeah. Right. Uh, okay, but the 
but the the um, the thing to realize is that the Eucharist is not simply the renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the Calvary, as it says in the Unde et Memores, it's also making present his, not only his passion, but also his resurrection Correct. and his ascension. Yes. Because when we receive Christ in the Holy Eucharist, we're not receiving the dead, dead Christ, that's right. Christ crucified, right. but rather we're receiving the risen Christ who has ascended into heaven. Correct, yes. The whole Christ, as the right. uh, theologian would say. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. divinity. Right? That's not right, just yeah. his body and his blood without his soul, right? right. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I guess I was I was more, more using that analogy just from the term of someone coming from a Nova Sordo uh, place where right. they're all of a sudden feel like they're being robbed of something to do. Right. Well, the, now what I would say to that is that the 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 old mass is actually very liberating mm-hmm. because it it enables. Let's say that at the, during the canon, yes, the priest is saying the canon silently. There's silence. What do I do now? Someone coming from the Novus Ordo might be at first a bit discombobulated because he doesn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, what's going on? However, perhaps over time, uh, or perhaps by my telling him right now, uh, that silence gives the faithful freedom to pray in their own words, maybe to follow the, the canon, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps to meditate on something that just occurred to him. You know, mm-hmm. He's now going to smell the, the roses, as it were, the, mm-hmm. this, this particular spiritual flower, he's, gonna, he's going to stay there a little bit. Maybe someone else is going to pray the Sorrowful Mysteries or something, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whatever. It, it, there's, there is uh, this total yeah. independence that right. or freedom yeah. to, to with, obviously within the context of the Mass, but you're not forced to listen to the priest recite the canon. Right. You're not forced to do that. Yeah. And I'm using that word deliberately because when that's not happening, you're, yeah, you feel at first you might say, well, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah. Sort of like uh, uh, a, a, someone who, say, grew up in the, the former Soviet Union where there was very little to do when you went into, uh, when you went into a, a, a supermarket, mm-hmm. if, if those existed there. Not much on the shelves, not much choice. Mm-hmm. You go into a, then if you go, if that person goes to the United States and goes into a Home Depot or yeah, a supermarket, like essentially over 30 mm-hmm. different cereals, what is, yeah, you yeah. this, what, what do I do? I, how, how do I, how do I mm-hmm. negotiate that? So it's, it's, it's a similar experience. You, right. you're, you're not sure how to right. respond, what to do with this, because it's such a different experience. But once you understand, you're actually free. It's like, go, pray. Do, yes. you know? yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not, we're not going to be forcing you to participate in this one way by listening to me, the right. priest, recite the canon or, or whatever right. else. Right, exactly. That, that is a, a very, um, it's a very good thing. And I think the faithful should be uh, much more resolute in preserving and protecting their liturgical freedom, so to speak. Yeah, to be able to just, it's and it's beautiful to be able to bring everything that you've got with you that's in your life that's to right. that exactly. moment exactly. right exactly. there. And everybody has a different thing to bring. Of course. You know, we have different different struggles, different crises going, we're going through. Or even like the, right. the, the joys and the that's blessings right. and, and all, all of it. The whole just, thing can be brought and, and we, uh, it's a lot harder to do that when you're being, when you're forced, as it were, to mm-hmm. listen to yeah. the priest recite a That's right. prayer. Yeah. Uh, and go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, just to kind of put a bow tie, because I know we're getting up here in time, but um, just looking forward into things that we can do uh, to, we, you and I have been talking um, off recording about ideas and things like that to, to make available to listeners so that they can grow in their understanding of Latin. Yes. Uh, we talked about uh, understanding chant. We yes. talked about understanding prayers. And just as a side note, one of the reasons why this I started this podcast was because I, I heard um, just taking things into the supernatural or the supernatural into the what we can't see, the invisible, that demons absolutely detest Latin because yes. they can't get away with hardly anything. The the words mean mm-hmm. exactly what so I mm-hmm. I started praying the rosary in Latin and taught myself to do it specifically to just have a more efficacious prayer life. Um, But 
it's just grown so much beyond that. So now to, to think about um, returning tra- to tradition and the traditional prayers that are, I mean, we might say them like the angel of God prayer, but to be able to say that in Latin and to teach your children that in, in Latin right. and understanding. Um, could you talk a little bit about just ideas of, uh, and perhaps things that we might make available, but just ideas to, to start uh, uh, learning or fostering and understanding so that when they step into tradition or they, they begin to, to taste some of this, they're not overwhelmed or they don't feel like they're lost. Right. Well, with, with regard to the liturgy in general, I think it's very important for adults to, to try to, uh, or just to allow themselves to experience the liturgy as a child would. A child is going there with without any other without any preconceived notions or anything. As with anything, he goes and he and he just experiences reality, whatever it might be. So in this case, it's the liturgy. So don't go there. Don't go to the liturgy with a um, uh, say with how you understand or how you expect the liturgy to function. You just kind of keep an open mind. It's like if you went to a Byzantine liturgy, right? Something totally foreign. Mm-hmm. Uh, you go there. Let's say someone's bringing you as a guest. Um, you're probably not going to be trying to follow along in the, in in the book, Greek or Greek <laughs> well, yeah, but you, basically you're just going to watch and see and hear and and simply take it in. It's like it's like going to a concert, right? Mm-hmm. It, 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 it might be more to it. You might be praying in, in your own mm-hmm. way and so forth, but you're you're experiencing something and and it's new and and so I would say let yourself experience it the way a child would with your senses. Don't don't try to understand it like oh I, got, I open my missile and see what's going on here. At least not at first, uh, or at least if you happen to stumble upon an old mass uh, by accident, just, <laughs> yeah. just do that. Now if you are if you are um, if you do want to really understand what's going on, that, that's a that's a premium in your in your scale of values. I got to understand that Latin. Uh, okay, that, no problem. But then. Uh, you you are committing yourself to investing a certain amount of time. Right. Don't expect the the liturgy to spoon feed you. Mm. Right? I would say this: liturgy is like great art. It is one of the greatest works of art uh, ever produced, at least in the West, and probably only in the West. The the notwithstanding, well, and I don't want to. The same thing is true with with the Eastern Rite liturgies too. But yes. So just looking at the at the Roman Rite, you have. Uh, this this tremendous wealth it's it's a it's like looking at a very very elaborate oil painting of some sort gigantic canvas and um, if you if you go in to a museum to look at at some let's say the, let's say the, the Sistine Chapel just look at at the Last Judgment scene of you know, right Angela. yes yeah you just look at that, oh that's nice and then you go you go on your merry way. Have you really understood that? No. Okay, you've seen a few colors and so forth, but no. Okay, there are hundreds of characters, uh, all kinds of stuff is going on. Uh, you could spend a long time <coughs> studying that that one painting. painting yeah. yeah, one painting. And and another thing to realize is the the, the way that you experience something is going to differ according to uh, your own education. Right? If you're a Buddhist looking at the the fresco of Raphael of the uh, what's known as the La- the the disputation on the sacrament, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Where you see the uh, painting of, of the sanctuary that yeah. turns out of St. Peter's, there's an altar, a monstrance, and then atop is a, a cloud bench with with all these uh, saints from mm-hmm. the New Testament. All right. So if you're a Catholic looking at that. You're going to pick up a lot of information because you you know you're educated as a Catholic, and so you you can see stuff that exactly. Raphael is doing. Right. If you're a Buddhist, you you don't know anything about Christianity. You're going to look at that and say, "Well, Raphael is obviously a pretty talented painter. You know, he's mm-hmm. very balanced. He's, look at that; it's wonderful." Does he have any any idea what it's all about? No. no. Okay. So, in a similar way with uh, with liturgy. Don't expect and don't demand to know everything there is to know uh, on day one, so that right. when you when you celebrate, when you participate in a liturgy, you your your demand for understanding everything is satisfied. Mm-hmm. No, it's a work of art. It's a great work of art. You need to do a little work. 
you need to experience it a bit more so that you can understand it gradually, just as you expect the same thing when you look at a Michelangelo fresco or Raphael. Don't expect to understand everything that's there immediately. Right. right? There, it's too big. It's too great. Too rich for that. Right. Uh, unless you're, you're you've 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 studied it. Uh, even an, even an, uh, an art critic has to study something like that yes, in order totally. to really. He might get much more out of it because of his education, but still, you have to, as it were, meditate, ponder on yes, such works yeah, of art. Totally. And the liturgy is the same way. So that has to be uh, just accepted in, in, uh, at the very beginning. Uh, don't don't be disappointed or or frustrated if you don't understand it as easily as you think you understand what's going on at the new mass. I mean, it's amazing how many people don't even understand. Yes. What the mass is all totally. about. Totally. Even yeah. though everything is in the vernacular. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. far as more people understood what the mass was really about. Yeah. That's right. When it was in Latin, not because yeah. it was in Latin, but because they had certain catechesis. I Correct. Yes. That. So. It's it's a uh, it's a it's a lifelong process. I mean, the liturgy is meant to be the basis of your life, you know, yeah. the, the, of your Christian worship, of prayer, and so forth. So it should have it should it should be rich. It should be solid. It should be something that you can sink your teeth into. It's not yeah. something that's uh, here we go again. It's the same thing. Yeah. And it's really a mark of genius that you have a certain repetition mm -hmm. in the liturgy. And yet it's, it doesn't get boring. Right. right? It, there's, it's like listening to a great piece of music. Right? Yeah. It doesn't get boring. Yeah. You, in fact, you'll probably pick things out that you didn't hear yeah, the first right. time. That's right. right. Exactly. So this is, uh, this is how I would say the faithful should, should be, uh, let's say, have the humility to appreciate that what they are getting into is bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. and, and it requires a certain effort on their part, but it's an effort that will be rewarded. It's like, again, going to the opera. If you, if you pay good money to get a seat at the opera and you want to watch, I don't know, Marriage of Figaro by Mozart, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose you could just pay and then just go and say, oh, this is, nice, this is nice. But usually what people do, especially if they pay a lot of money to, to, to go there, they are, they're going to study that opera. Totally. They're going to know who's playing, who are the singers, mm -hmm. what's the libretto, what's the plot, what's going on. Mm -hmm. right? So that when they go in there, even though it's in Italian, they have studied it well enough they're where they enough. understand exactly what's going on. Of course, they're usually the translation provided, yeah. but, but still, they, they they get it. And if they're really fanatic, they're going to learn Italian. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they're going to go overboard. Uh, but but they, they do some, some preliminary work so that they have what's called learned perceptivity they, mm. they perceive as those who are learned right they've they've learned something about what they are looking at yeah so that it's not just hitting them and, and, it, and there's no comprehension whatsoever. it's not just sensory uh data that's, that's right. just being you know imprinted right. on exactly. it yeah exactly. they're, they're able exactly. to intellectually right. contemplate that's right. what's being given to that's them right. at the same time so while i don't think it's it's vital that people learn Latin and understand it and everything. Uh, it's not essential, certainly, for one's salvation. Right. Still, it's there are many people who, who do, and there's nothing wrong with learning a language, and there's certainly nothing wrong with with understanding that that layer of the liturgy. Right. The better to, appre to appreciate it. Too. Totally. And so for those, of, those who have reached that level, who have had that desire, I'm happy to provide a, a certain uh, service. Uh, and how that's done, that, that can vary too. Some people have no Latin, some people have some Latin, uh, and, and just need a kind of a, a guide, uh, or, or want something that, that will just help them. You know, with totally. That. So uh, the, the, I would say it's probably a good idea for people to, who are interested in this to, to have some kind of Latin book, a Latin tech, a Latin grammar book. What, mm -hmm. There are so many out there. Uh, take your pick. That way, if if say I talk about, I don't know, the accusative case or the parts of speech or the, this is a verb, this is a noun, right? You you you're not like, what is he talking about? So a lot of a lot of when you're learning a language, there's a lot of technical terminology. Yeah. And uh, it's. It might sound intimidating at first, but it's it's just to give your 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 mind clarity about the concepts involved. Right? You want to know what the difference is between a subject and an object. Correct. Right? Uh, 
and hence between the nominative case and the accusative case. These are terms that have come down from centuries of studying language and teaching language, and they, they can't be discarded because we don't like them. No, we have to learn them. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, no way This is going to help you, actually, right. in the long run. So, uh, so unfortunately, grammar is not a, is not a very strong subject in uh, most people's education. And so this might, there might be a learning curve, even in one's own language. Uh, but it's helpful. It's very, very helpful to learn a language to know these terms. It's almost, in fact, it's, I would say it's essential. Uh, so uh, not to worry, but it's with, with Latin, you can't help but get into this stuff because in order to explain why, say, uh, it's dominus rather than dominum in this particular sentence, you have to talk about the difference between the nominative and the accusative case and what those, why those two cases exist, yes. what, what their function is. Yeah. And so uh, that might be one, one way to do this, you know, yeah. to, to uh, you say the, the Angelus, as we were talking about, right. and, and then uh, talk about the, the, what's going on grammatically uh, because the, the sentences in the, in the say the, the little versatile responses of mm -hmm. the Angelus are short enough where you can you can provide a translation and and even uh, you can see it pretty clearly. But then to say, well, okay, here's what's going on grammatically, and explaining that, and then maybe using that as a launch pad for maybe talking more, say, for conjugating or or declining a. a verb or non respectively mm -hmm. and to show how how things work like right that, that might be very very yeah. helpful fantastic um, so we'll see how things go and uh and i'm sure you'll be able to see from your uh podcast uh statistics whether yeah whether there's good feedback and good picking liking up on it right? absolutely exactly. no that's fantastic well i do want to wrap this up because yes. i know we've been here now more than an hour and uh and it's been very informative and a joy to just talk to you about all of this uh but uh would you mind uh, maybe just uh, uh finishing us off with with a prayer and uh, and then we'll uh, say goodbye well why don't we we pray the uh the ave maria and then i'll i'll impart a uh, priestly blessing Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. Benedictio Dei omnipotentis, Patris et Filii Iesus, et Sancti Vecinat super vos, et maniat semper. Amen. Very good. Patris et Filii Iesus, Sancti. Amen. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. What's going to be coming next is actually from Father Fromageau himself. He has recorded the altar server responses at low mass. And since I've been learning how to serve at low mass, I've discovered that there is something magnificent and beautiful. If you don't know what the Latin is saying, you need to look at it. You need to understand it. And Father teaches it to you in a very, very digestible format with the English corresponding to it. I will put up all of the text in the show notes so that you'll be able to follow along. I know you're going to love this next episode. So until then, God love you. Valete. God bless.